over 200 episodes. My mind is blown. Another World Audiobooks has blown past 200 episodes that we have done on this podcast. I am so excited, so grateful to everyone who has listened and made the show such a success. I could not have done it without you, and I'm so happy to be bringing these audiobooks to you, knowing that you're enjoying them, knowing that you're getting value out of this. As a thank you uh, for helping me reach 200 episodes, I want to do something special. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to enter anyone who requests a free audiobook from the website, anotherworldaudiobooks.com. Anyone who requests an audiobook from the website will get entered to win a free piece of merch from the Another World Audiobook store. So we've got t-shirts, we got hoodies, we got hats, we got all kinds of awesome stuff with all kinds of really cool Another World Audiobook stuff uh, designs on them. So if you want uh, to get in on that action, just go to anotherworldaudiobooks.com and you scroll down a little bit and it says your ticket to a free audiobook. Go ahead and click on that uh, to get your free audiobook. Request a free audiobook. And not only will you get a free audiobook for doing that, but you will also get entered into this drawing where I'm going to pick one lucky listener who's going to get a free piece of Another World Audiobooks merchandise. So make sure to check that out, and here's to the next 200 episodes. Hello and welcome back to Another World Audiobooks. Super happy to have you here as we approach the end of The Return of Tarzan. Only a few chapters left and today's chapter gets really exciting. So be sure to stay tuned for that, which I'm assuming you'll do since you are listening to this episode. Uh, I did want to give a huge shout out as always to our amazing patrons, to Mike Corky, Adiosa, and to Renee. Thank you guys so much for supporting the podcast by being patrons. I also want to give a huge shout out to E... Burnson? Uh, it's on YouTube, so I'm not sure uh, about those YouTube names, how to pronounce them all the time, but he said, a huge thanks for all the amazing content and passion across many platforms. Tarzan is a book that I read annually, and now I'm adding your audiobook to my annual enjoyment. Sherlock Holmes is a favorite character of mine, and your series of audiobooks definitely enhanced my love and appreciation for the stories. Again, huge thanks. Uh, so, well, <laughs> thank you, E. e. Burnson. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, but thank you so much for for that it just makes my day to hear stuff like that just to know that people are enjoying the podcast and enjoying the the stuff that we're putting out it really just makes my day makes this all so worthwhile so thank you if you want to shout out on the show be sure to let me know what you think of the show even if you hate it i'd love to hear from you <laughs> well maybe not quite as much as i like hearing from people like e burnson but uh, i would still love to hear from you get in touch let me know what you think of the show and uh, most importantly what book you'd like to hear me do next because like i said we're coming up on the end of Tarzan here and need to get into a new book. So let me know. Uh, so yeah, let's get into it. Without further ado, I give you the next chapter of The Return of Tarzan. Chapter 24 How Tarzan Came Again to Opar When Clayton returned to the shelter and found Jane Porter was missing, he became frantic with fear and grief. He found Monsieur Thurin quite rational, the fever having left him with surprising suddenness, which is one of its peculiarities. The Russian, weak and exhausted, still lay upon his bed of grasses within the shelter. When Clayton asked him about the girl, he seemed surprised to know that she was not there. "'I have heard nothing unusual,' he said. "'But then I have been unconscious much of the time.' Had it not been for the man's very evident weakness— Clayton should have suspected him of having sinister knowledge of the girl's whereabouts. But he could see that Thurin lacked sufficient vitality even to descend unaided from the shelter. He could not, in his present physical condition, have harmed the girl, nor could he have climbed the rude ladder back to the shelter. Until dark, the Englishman searched the nearby jungle for a trace of the missing one, or a sign of the trail of her abductor. But though the spore left by the fifty frightful men, unversed in woodcraft as they were, would have been as plain to the densest denizen of the jungle as a city street to the Englishman, yet he crossed and recrossed it twenty times without observing the slightest indication that many men had passed that way but a few short hours since. As he searched, Clayton continued to call the girl's name aloud, but the only result of this was to attract Numa the lion. Fortunately, the man saw the shadowy form worming its way toward him in time to climb into the branches of a tree before the beast was close enough to reach him. This put an end to his search for the balance of the afternoon, 
as the line paced back and forth beneath him until dark. Even after the beast had left, Clayton dared not descend into the awful blackness beneath him, and so he spent a terrifying and hideous night in the tree. The next morning he returned to the beach, relinquishing the last hope of succoring Jane Porter. During the week that followed, Monsieur Thurin rapidly regained his strength, lying in the shelter while Clayton hunted food for both. The men never spoke, except as necessity demanded. Clayton now occupied the section of the shelter which had been reserved for Jane Porter, and only saw the Russian when he took food or water to him, or performed the other kindly offices which common humanity required. When Thurin was again able to descend in search of food, Clayton was stricken with fever. For days he lay tossing in delirium and suffering, but not once did the Russian come near him. Food the Englishman could not have eaten, but his craving for water amounted practically to torture. Between the recurrent attacks of delirium, weak though he was, he managed to reach the brook once a day and fill a tiny can that had been among the few appointments of the lifeboat. Thurin watched him on these occasions, with an expression of malignant pleasure. He seemed really to enjoy the suffering of the man who, despite the just contempt in which he held him, had ministered to him to the best of his ability, while he lay suffering the same agonies. At last, Clayton became so weak that he was no longer able to descend from the shelter. For a day he suffered for water without appealing to the Russian, but finally, unable to endure it longer, he asked Thurin to fetch him a drink. The Russian came to the entrance to Clayton's room, a dish of water in his hand. A nasty grin contorted his features. "'Here is the water,' he said. "'But first, let me remind you that you maligned me before the girl, that you kept her to yourself and would not share her with me.' Clayton interrupted him. "'Stop!' he cried. "'Stop!' What manner of cur are you that you traduce the character of a good woman whom we believe dead? God, I was a fool ever to let you live. You are not fit to live even in this vile land. Here is your water, said the Russian. All you will get. And he raised the basin to his lips and drank. What was left he threw out upon the ground below. Then he turned and left the sick man. Clayton rolled over, and, burying his face in his arms, gave up the battle. The next day, Thurin determined to set out toward the north along the coast, for he knew that eventually he must come to the habitation of civilized men. At least he could be no worse off than he was here, and, furthermore, the ravaging of the dying Englishman was getting on his nerves. So he stole Clayton's spear and set off upon his journey. He would have killed the sick man before he left, had it not occurred to him that it would really have been a kindness to do so. That same day he came to a little cabin by the beach, and his heart filled with renewed hope as he saw this evidence of the proximity of civilization, for he thought it but the outpost of a nearby settlement. Had he known to whom it belonged, and that its owner was at that very moment but a few miles inland, Nicholas Rokov would have fled the place as he would a pestilence. But he did not know, and so he remained for a few days to enjoy the security and comparative comforts of the cabin. Then he took up his northward journey once more. In Lord Tennington's camp, preparations were going forward to build permanent quarters, and then to send out an expedition of a few men to the north in search of relief. As the days had passed without bringing the longed-for succour, Hope that Jane Porter, Clayton, and Monsieur Thurin had been rescued began to die. No one spoke of the matter longer to Professor Porter, and he was so immersed in his scientific dreaming that he was not aware of the elapse of time. Occasionally, he would remark that within a few days they should certainly see a steamer drop anchor off their shore, and that then they should all be reunited happily. Sometimes he spoke of it as a train— and wondered if it were being delayed by snowstorms. "'If I didn't know the dear old fellow so well by now,' Tennington remarked to Miss Strong, "'I should be quite certain that he was uh, not quite right, don't you know?' "'If it were not so pathetic, it would be ridiculous,' said the girl sadly. "'I, who have known him all my life, know how he worships Jane, but to others it must seem that he is perfectly callous to her fate.' 
It is only that he is so absolutely impractical that he cannot conceive of so real a thing as death unless certain proof of it is thrust upon him. You'd never guess what he was about yesterday, continued Tennington. I was coming in alone from a little hunt when I met him walking rapidly up the game trail that I was following back to camp. His hands were clasped beneath the tails of his long black coat, and his top hat was set firmly down upon his head, as with eyes bent upon the ground he hastened on, probably to some sudden death had I not intercepted him. "'Why, where in the world are you bound, Professor?' I asked him. "'I am going into town, Lord Tennington,' he said, as seriously as possible, to complain to the postmaster about the rural free delivery service we are suffering from here.' "'Why, sir, I haven't had a piece of mail in weeks. There should be several letters for me from Jane. The matter must be reported to Washington at once.' "'And would you believe it, Miss Strong?' continued Tennington. "'I had the very deuce of a job to convince the old fellow that there was not only no rural free delivery, but no town, and that he was not even on the same continent as Washington, nor in the same hemisphere.' When he did realize, he commenced to worry about his daughter. I think it is the first time that he really has appreciated our position here, or the fact that Miss Porter may not have been rescued. I hate to think about it, said the girl. And yet I can think of nothing else than the absent members of our party. Let us hope for the best, replied Tennington. You yourself have set us each a splendid example of bravery, for, in a way, your loss has been the greatest. Yes, she replied. I could have loved Jane Porter no more had she been my own sister. Tennington did not show the surprise he felt. That was not at all what he had meant. He had been much with this fair daughter of Marilyn since the wreck of the Lady Alice, and it had recently come to him that he had grown much more fond of her than would prove good for the peace of his mind, for he recalled almost constantly now the confidence which Monsieur Thurin had imparted to him that he and Miss Strong were engaged. He wondered if, after all, Thurin had been quite accurate in his statement. He had never seen the slightest indication on the girl's part of more than ordinary friendship. "'And then, in Monsieur Thurin's loss, if they are lost, you would suffer a severe bereavement,' he ventured. She looked up at him quickly. Monsieur Thurin had become a very dear friend, she said. I liked him very much, though I have known him but a short time. Then you were not engaged to marry him, he blurted out. Heavens, no, she cried. I did not care for him at all in that way. There was something that Lord Tennington wanted to say to Hazel Strong. He wanted very badly to say it, and to say it at once. But somehow the words stuck in his throat. He started lamely a couple of times, cleared his throat, became red in the face, and finally ended by remarking that he hoped the cabins would be finished before the rainy season commenced. But, though he did not know it, he had conveyed to the girl the very message he intended, and it left her happy, happier than she had ever before been in all her life. Just then, further conversation was interrupted by the sight of a strange and terrible-looking figure which emerged from the jungle just south of the camp. Tennington and the girl saw it at the same time. The Englishman reached for his revolver, and when the half-naked, bearded creature called his name aloud and came running toward them, he dropped his hand and advanced to meet it. None would have recognized in the filthy, emaciated creature, covered by a single garment of small skins, the immaculate Monsieur Thurin the party had last seen upon the deck of the Lady Alice. Before the other members of the little community were apprised of his presence, Tennington and Miss Strong questioned him regarding the other occupants of the missing boat. "'They are all dead,' replied Thurin. "'The three sailors died before we made land.' Miss Porter was carried off into the jungle by some wild animal while I was lying delirious with fever. Clayton died of the same fever but a few days since. And to think that all this time we have been separated by but a few miles, scarcely a day's march, it is terrible. How long Jane Porter lay in the darkness of the vault beneath the temple in the ancient city of Opar she did not know. For a time she was delirious with fever, but after this passed, she commenced slowly to regain her strength. 
Every day, the woman who brought her food beckoned to her to arise, but for many days the girl could only shake her head to indicate that she was too weak. But eventually she was able to gain her feet, and then to stagger a few steps by supporting herself with one hand upon the wall. Her captors now watched her with increasing interest. The day was approaching, and the victim was gaining in strength. Presently the day came, and a young woman whom Jane Porter had not seen before came with several others to her dungeon. Here some sort of ceremony was performed. That it was of a religious nature the girl was sure, and so she took new heart and rejoiced that she had fallen among people upon whom the refining and softening influences of religion evidently had fallen. They would treat her humanely, of that she was now quite sure. And so, when they led her from her dungeon, through long, dark corridors, and up a flight of concrete steps to a brilliant courtyard, she went willingly, even gladly, for was she not among the servants of God? It might be, of course, that their interpretation of the Supreme Being differed from her own, but that they owned a God was sufficient evidence to her that they were kind and good. But, when she saw a stone altar in the centre of the courtyard, and dark brown stains upon it and the nearby concrete of the floor, she began to wonder and to doubt. And as they stooped and bound her ankles and secured her wrists behind her, her doubts were turned to fear. A moment later, as she was lifted and placed supine across the altar's top, hope left her entirely, and she trembled in an agony of fright. During the grotesque dance of the votaries which followed, she lay frozen in horror, nor did she require the sight of the thin blade in the hands of the high priestess as it rose slowly above her to enlighten her further as to her doom. As the hand began its descent, Jane Porter closed her eyes and sent up a silent prayer to the maker she was so soon to face. Then she succumbed to the strain upon her tired nerves and swooned. Day and night, Tarzan of the Apes raced through the primeval forest toward the ruined city in which he was positive the woman he loved lay either a prisoner or dead. In a day and a night, he covered the same distance that the fifty frightful men had taken the better part of a week to traverse, for Tarzan of the Apes traveled along the middle terrace, high above the tangled obstacles that impede progress upon the ground. The story the young bull ape had told made it clear to him that the girl captive had been Jane Porter, for there was not another small white she in all the jungle. The bulls he had recognized from the ape's crude description as the grotesque parodies upon humanity who inhabit the ruins of Opar. And the girl's fate he could picture as plainly as though he were an eyewitness to it. When they would lay her across that trim altar he could not guess, but that her dear, frail body would eventually find its way there, he was confident. But finally, after what seemed long ages to the impatient ape-man, he topped the barrier cliffs that hemmed the desolate valley, and below him lay the grim and awful ruins of the now hideous city of Opar. At a rapid trot, he started across the dry and dusty, boulder-strewn ground toward the goal of his desires. Would he be in time to rescue? He hoped against hope. At least he could be revenged, and in his wrath it seemed to him that he was equal to the task of wiping out the entire population of that terrible city. It was nearly noon when he reached the great boulder at the top of which terminated the secret passage to the pits beneath the city. Like a cat, he scaled the precipitous sides of the frowning granite kopje. A moment later he was running through the darkness of the long, straight tunnel that led to the treasure vault. Through this he passed, then on and on, until at last he came to the well-like shaft upon the opposite side of which lay the dungeon with the false wall. As he paused a moment upon the brink of the well, a faint sound came to him through the opening above. His ears caught and translated it. It was the dance of death that preceded a sacrifice, and the sing-song ritual of the high priestess. He could even recognize the woman's voice. Could it be that the ceremony marked the very thing he had so hastened to prevent? A wave of horror swept over him. Was he, after all, to be just a moment too late? Like a frightened deer, he leaped across the narrow chasm to the continuation of the passage beyond. At the false wall, he tore like one possessed to demolish the barrier that confronted him. With giant muscles, he forced the opening, 
thrusting his head and shoulders through the first small hole he made, and carrying the balance of the wall with him, to clatter resoundingly upon the cement floor of the dungeon. With a single leap, he cleared the length of the chamber and threw himself against the ancient door. But here he stopped. The mighty bars upon the other side were proof even against such muscles as his. It needed but a moment's effort to convince him of the futility of endeavouring to force the impregnable barrier. There was but one other way, and that led back through the long tunnels to the boulder a mile beyond the city's walls, and then back across the open as he had come to the city first with his waziri. He realized that to retrace his steps and enter the city from above ground would mean that he would be too late to save the girl, if it were indeed she who lay upon the sacrificial altar above him. But there seemed no other way, and so he turned and ran swiftly back into the passageway beyond the broken wall. At the well, he heard again the monotonous voice of the high priestess, and, as he glanced aloft, the opening, twenty feet above, seemed so near that he was tempted to leap for it in a mad endeavour to reach the inner courtyard that lay so near. If he could but get one end of his grass rope caught upon some projection at the top of that tantalising aperture. In the instant's pause and thought, an idea occurred to him. He would attempt it. Turning back to the tumbled wall, he seized one of the large, flat slabs that had composed it. Hastily making one end of his rope fast to the piece of granite, he returned to the shaft, and, coiling the balance of the rope on the floor beside him, the ape-man took the heavy slab in both hands, and, swinging it several times to get the distance and the direction fixed, he let the weight fly up at a slight angle, so that, instead of falling straight back into the shaft again, it grazed the far edge, tumbling over into the courtyard above. Tarzan dragged for a moment upon the slack end of the rope, until he felt that the stone was lodged with fair security at the shaft's top. Then he swung out over the black depths beneath. The moment his full weight came upon the rope, he felt it slip from above. He waited there, in awful suspense, as it dropped in little jerks, inch by inch. The stone was being dragged up the outside of the masonry surrounding the top of the shaft. Would it catch at the very edge? Or would his weight drag it over to fall upon him as he hurtled into the unknown depths below? Oh boy, let's see if those uh, mighty muscles can uh, survive that kind of a, a fall, whatever may be happening there to Tarzan. Stay tuned, uh, next week we're going to carry on with chapter 25 where we're going to get in and figure out what happens to Tarzan and Jane because she's about to die. Oh, uh, can't have that happen. They have to get together, right? Well, tune in next week. You'll find out. Um, yeah, thanks guys for listening. Remember to uh, let me know what you think of the show. Let me know which book you'd like to hear next. I always love to hear suggestions from uh, listeners. And um, yeah, I'm giving away a free audiobook on the website. Go to anotherworldaudiobooks.com and you can put in your email and get a free audiobook sent to you. Uh, and free means that literally it doesn't cost you any money. Uh, which is generally speaking the definition of free if in case you didn't know that and yeah i would love to send that to you thanks so much for listening thanks for sharing the show with everybody that you know who might enjoy a free audiobook we'll talk to you next week this is carl hi carl needs a website for his business i sell the world's finest flavored toothpicks but sadly for carl he doesn't know all the techie complicated website stuff so he's just out of luck and his business is doomed to fail in this digital age of um actually i got my website set up super fast and easy with invicta.services you what? Yeah, it was super easy. I just picked the style I liked, made a few quick, simple customizations, and bam! Awesome website where I can sell my flavored toothpicks. Well, that's, well... Amazing? I was going to say, probably expensive. Actually, getting a website with Invicta starts at only $24 per month. $24 per month? That's less than what I spend on vocal creams per month. It's awesome. It gets you website hosting, a beautiful, professionally designed, customizable template, ongoing site maintenance, regular WordPress plugin, and template updates. I don't say this often. But, wow. I know, right? Invicta.services, a simple, affordable way to get a beautiful, professional website for your business. Just go to Invicta.services to launch your website today. That's Invicta, I-N-V-I-C-T-A dot services. Invicta.services, a professional website, headache-free.
And just for Another World Audiobooks listeners, go to Invicta.Services and then enter the code Another World to get your first month free. That's right. Go to Invicta.Services and enter Another World as your coupon code to get an entire month free and get started with your professional website at Invicta.Services.